Hello, welcome to Interdependent Study, our podcast where we engage in the learning and unlearning work for social justice and collective liberation. I'm Aaron. And I'm Damien. Thank you so much for joining us today. For those new to our podcast, Interdependent Study is meant to be a space and community for folks who believe in and want to do the work for social justice. That's right. Each week we bring something new to the table and discuss our thoughts and feelings about it through the lenses of who we are and where we can go for a more just society. And we would like Interdependent Study to be a space we're always learning with one another. That's the goal. That's the goal. Uh, and Damien, you're up this week. So what are you bringing to the table today? Yes, I have brought a conversation to the table for us today. Mm -hmm. Conversation is featured in a piece called Insecurity is a Feature, Not a Bug of Capitalism, But It Can Spark Resistance. Uh, and it was written by C.J. Polycaracnio. I may have gotten that wrong again. Uh, sorry, C.J., apologies. Uh, published by Truthout, actually, uh, earlier this month. So if folks want to read this piece, too, they can find it on Truthout's website. Um, and in broad strokes, the, this piece is a conversation between C.J. and Astra Taylor, uh, who we've talked about on the pod before. Uh, the conversation centers around Astra Taylor's new book, which is called The Age of Insecurity, Coming Together as Things Fall Apart, um, which I'm sure we'll want to add that to our book list here soon. Yep. Uh, this conversation is all about this concept that she writes about, which is that capitalism is this insecurity producing machine that has an impact on all of us. But Astra believes that it could help us in our fight for radical change and collective liberation as well. It's this sort of this dual headed monster, but we could, we can, it has some, we have the capability of using it for good, if you will. So to our advantage, I should say. So yeah, I um, am super excited to chat about this piece. It was really great. Mm -hmm. Where do you want to start? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I thought this was great as you just said. Yeah. Uh, and really focus on that new book, yeah. uh, which was cool. And it, it, I think, Reveal to me that we really should read that book soon. Absolutely. Um, soon is relative. There are lots of things that we should read soon. Yes. Uh, and <laughs> We've got a long list not, of things. <laughs> not a lot of time in which we can read those things. What is but, time? <laughs> uh, time is just a flat circle. Yeah. Um, <laughs> thanks, Matthew McConaughey. Yeah. Uh, because, you know, as you mentioned, she points out all these ways that capitalism produces insecurity yes and then exploits that insecurity that it that it produced and i think deep diving into the book would be a great way to explore her analysis and broaden our own understanding of that dynamic yeah um but i think this is a really great primer for that analysis to understand some of the basics of how student debt housing costs health care and a lot of other aspects of our economy create that insecurity that then gets exploited and we end up wherever we end up um, right. in an economic system that's not built for everybody. Not at all. Um, and one of the other things I should point out is that I think this was such a great piece because, like you said, uh, Astra's analysis is great, right? Which mm -hmm. means her analysis in the book is going to be great. Yep. But CJ also asked some really powerful, great questions as well. Mm -hmm. So that allowed them to just have this wide-ranging conversation that, I don't know, I really appreciated. Um, one of the things that Astra talked about in this piece were her, uh, was her thoughts on capitalism. So I wanted to sort of talk about that with you here. You know, she talks about how capitalism, as you mentioned, not only exploits the insecurities that I think many slash most of us feel and face in our everyday lives. Mm -hmm. right? She talks about that, but she also talks about how it generates those insecurities. Um, and so, you know, it's, it's, I appreciate her understanding and her sort of lens there. I, I appreciated, in addition, how she framed this to help us understand her thoughts on this. Mm -hmm. So I pulled a quote. Mm -hmm. She says this. Insecurity, in other words, isn't just an unfortunate byproduct of our current competitive economic order. It's a core product. If you aren't insecure, you don't keep buying, hustling, accumulating. Insecurity is the stick that keeps us scrambling and striving. And yet, as you note, she's talking to CJ here, insecurity is also a natural part of life. In the book, I distinguish between two kinds of insecurities. First, there is existential insecurity, or the kind of insecurity that is inherent to human life, and that stems from the fact that we are mortal creatures who can't survive without the care of others. Then there is what I call manufactured insecurity, and this is the kind of insecurity that is essential to the functioning of a market society. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, again, I, I appreciate the nuance there in her explanation and, and analysis of capitalism. That that manufactured insecurity that she talks about is something that has been a key feature of our economy for forever, right? Like, yes, since right? the beginning. Since the beginning of 
time, the flat surface you talk about. Mm. Uh, and, you know, it's something we've talked about, I think, in lots of our conversations here on the pod. And we've talked about class issues, labor unions, the labor movement, movements for economic justice, and and, and just so much more. Mm, yeah, I really appreciated that uh, analysis that that she called insecurity a core product. Yeah. Uh, and the way she breaks down the differences between existential and manufactured insecurity. And one of the ways that I think about how insecurity is a core product of our economy is that the major way that we're supposed to seek out security is through work. Yes. <laughs> you know, it's yeah. selling our labor to make ends meet. And Astra Taylor writes about this in her book. She mentions specifically the way that this developed, quote, looking back over the centuries to the dawn of the industrial era. I show how capitalism began by making people insecure in this modern sense by severing people from their communities and traditional livelihoods so they had nothing to sell but their labor. Wow. We see this dynamic playing out today as officials pursue monetary policies explicitly designed to weaken the hand of workers. That's the manufactured insecurity at work. There it is. And so our system is set up not to have full employment. And there are people who are therefore deliberately left out of work. So they can't sell their labor in the way that we are forced to, which means they are deliberately left insecure in almost every area of our society. And especially with the reductions attacks Mm. on the social safety net in recent decades, which she mentions in the in the book, in the article, uh, the social safety net was set up in response to the Great Depression. And so we have this cycle of things happening where right. hardcore free market, so to speak, politicians want to get rid of that social safety net, which mm. is how we got to the point where we needed to create one in the first place. Absolutely. Yeah. I, the, the idea of it being this core product is... Uh, is so a spot on, I think. And really when you sort of play that out and, you know, you mentioned she, because, because she mentioned it, like this being a key feature since the Great Depression. Like this is the way the yes. system yep. has been designed. This is the way that we all have sort of uh, lived our lives trying to make our way through this system um, that isn't designed for our health and our safety and our families and our mm -hmm. communities and our ability to sort of um, live these lives that we, we all deserve. Um, and so, yeah, I, I appreciate that. One of the other things that she talked about in this piece, in this conversation that I wanted to bring up is, right, we've talked a little bit about some of the negatives. And she talks about, you know, this insecurity cutting both ways. So one of the things I think is clear, it's easy to see how this insecurity can negatively affect all of us and how those in positions of power can use it and twist it and manipulate it um, and manipulate the system to exploit our insecurities. And especially when we're talking about big, important things like big aspects of our lives, housing, debt, <laughs> health care, education, these sort of big systems that we all live in and take part in. Um, and so she talks about that, but I also love that she talks about what else this insecurity can do and can be for us. Um, she says that it can be, her words are, it can be a conduit to empathy, humility, belonging, and solidarity. And so I, I, I loved that, you know, that great depression quote, she, I highlighted it too. <laughs> um, she, she talked about Franklin Roosevelt. Now he called insecurity one of the most fearsome evils of our economic system and made the concept of ins of security a cornerstone of the welfare state. And so she goes on to say, I can I certainly see insecurity, shame, fear, anxiety about the future transformed into solidarity in my work with the debt collective. And I, I appreciated that. We've talked about the debt collective and their work on the pod before, and we believe in what they're doing as it relates to economic justice. But um, I think this idea of solidarity and a collective shift in our thinking about insecurity is powerful. And I think it can help win economic justice and, and certainly more for all of us, if that makes sense. Yeah. And I think that built in solidarity has been challenged so much. Yeah through policies set forth by a variety of administrations on the state and the federal level. Yeah. And right now it's being cut into by the right wing who see this solidarity as a threat to their own political power, yeah. their own ability to hang on to um, what power they have left and, and try to accumulate more of it. 
And Astra says, quote, the right wing knows this and is dedicated to inflaming people's insecurities, encouraging them to misdirect their rage toward the even more vulnerable Mm. rather than the economic system and the elites who profit from the status quo. So we see this with so many things we've talked about on this podcast um, from the critical race theory backlash yeah. to anti-trans and anti-gay legislation to negative reaction to the labor movement to immigration, all kinds of things. And it's yeah. a way to prey on this manufactured insecurity that's baked into the economic system and exploit people into believing and therefore voting for these yep. politicians yep. that the little slice of security that they have gotten, that they've been able to hold on to and grasp in this system will be taken from them if we allow people to, say, critically examine our laws and history through the lenses of white supremacy. (laughs) Or that you're going to lose something if somehow trans people are allowed to exist comfortably as themselves. Right. And it's all just nonsense because the thing that's most likely going to take away your security, as Astra Taylor says, is the very system that we're all taught to buy into. Absolutely. Yeah, that's such a critical piece of this in point. And, you know, we, I, I feel so strongly about this idea that we should not be listening to politicians who pit us against each other, mm-hmm. right? And tell us that, you know, it's, it's, it's these people who are taking your rights or whatever you're entitled to away from you. That is not it, right? Mm. And so, um, uh, this makes me so excited to read this book and I, I, I can't wait to do it um, because I think she has just such a brilliant analysis and the work that the Debt Collective in particular does around this issue um, is important. But as you say, it impacts so many aspects of our lives and we see the right attacking so many. It's the same playbook, but just in so many different aspects of our lives. So, yeah, I... I appreciate that. This mm-hmm. system we're all buying into. Yeah. All right. Well, this feels like a good place to shift our conversation over to the application portion of our show. Um, how can we apply our conversation and this piece to our everyday lives and our work? Um, you know, this made me think about how we talk about collective liberation on this show, right? And we talk about it because it's something that we believe in and that we're fighting for. And it's something that for me, for us, is so connected to the notion of humanity, and the world that we believe we all deserve. And this connects to what I was talking about earlier and I think is at the heart of this conversation that CJ and Astra have, and certainly what Astra most, I'm I'm assuming, talks about in her book. When one of us wins, we all win. Mm -hmm. And we have to work together to get there. And so to that point, Astra ends the conversation in this piece from Truth Out by saying this, quote, our small but mighty movement has come a long way in a decade. I believe that we will win if people get off the sidelines and join us. And then a little later on, she says this, quote, we've had victories, we've had setbacks, and then more victories and setbacks. I've been in the trenches long enough to know that's how movements go. The arc of justice is, sadly, rather crooked and sometimes loops back on itself. But this is not a moment to throw up our hands. It's one to keep holding the president's feet to the fire. The movement for debt abolition is just getting started. And so I, I, I love that. Like Clearly, she's talking about debt abolition here. But this idea of larger movement, us being in it together, is so important that we all have to do our part. We all have to work together in these moments when they present, a, when they present themselves because um, it means, and I really do believe this, and I know you do too, we'll all win. Yeah, we do all win. My application is about solidarity. And as you as you mentioned, when one of us wins, we all win. And this either or zero sum game type of stuff that gets used by politicians to drive a wedge between us and to blame other people for whatever. uh, We don't have to do it that way. Uh, We can, like they did during the Great Depression, like FDR said, respond differently to insecurity and call it out as an evil that is inherent to our system and recreate a social safety net that's even stronger than it was, than it has been. Right. Because I think if we do that now, we will make it include everyone. Yes. In ways that the New Deal intentionally left people out because they couldn't get it through unless they did that by leaving out all kinds of folks. And so if we do that social safety net today... All of us will be in everybody's ear saying, no, no, you have to include 
this, you have to include this, you have to include this. You can't let the housing code be written in this way that specifically leaves people out and eliminates their ability to create a larger slice of security for themselves and their family long term. Absolutely. So, yeah, yeah I love that. And this piece about all of us in it together, all of us understanding this, right? And then all of us advocating for that and yeah. you know calling our representatives making it clear that we believe in this voting that way when you know it is election season um that's so important so yeah i i love that our applications are in sync there this idea that when one of us wins we all win that's so so important that's very good um all right well let's talk about homework mm -hmm. uh what do we want to do when we leave this here table of ours today to continue our learning um, I, I'm going to say it. This is going to be the obvious one. I'm going to take it from you. I want us to read Asher Taylor's book. Um, uh, that certainly was the center of this conversation that, um, she and CJ had. The book is called the age of insecurity coming together as things fall apart. Uh, and it was just published back in September. So it's still hot off the presses, but I think about this conversation and I think about the fact that we read remake the world. Was that just earlier this year? I think it was the start think of the so. year. Yeah. That was the first thing. That was the first, first thing book we read. Yeah. Um, and I learned a lot from that book and her analysis in it. And so I feel confident that, you know, we'll enjoy this new one as well. And I think the the notion of financial insecurity in our capitalist society is something that, you know, is not going to go away tomorrow. And so it's something that we need to learn from. And, you know, in an analysis like the one that Astra offers in this book. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, yep. I'm going to add this book to our running list of books. Yep. We'll get to it. I'm excited about it. Yeah. Uh, what about you? What do yeah, you think? gratefully adding this to the to read list. Yes. Uh, which is ever, ever expanding. <laughs> um, they also mentioned the Vienna social housing policy in the interview. Oh, yeah. So I'd love to learn a little bit more about that. Um, it's mentioned in the book and in the interview as an alternative approach to housing policy than what we have in the U.S. It seems like they've done a lot of work to get rent controlled, affordable housing to as many people as possible in Austria. And they've destigmatized it in a way that makes it seem like a cool thing to do. Yeah. And so there are the, the article that is linked, uh, I pulled up just momentarily and the first part of the story is about a young professional person who is living in uh, public subsidized housing okay. and is paying, it, you know, it's a small-ish apartment, one room, um, and they're paying like 350 euro a month or something wow. in the city center of, of Vienna. Right. So it seems like they're doing really cool things with that kind of social safety net housing policy yes. uh, approach that would be great to learn more about just to see what else other people are doing beyond the failed policies that we've, uh, well, in a lot of ways that ha they have, uh, they have failed because they were designed to. Hey, there but, it is. Yeah. Yeah. I, yeah, there's a lot to learn there. And right now she talks about how this is certainly uh, what's happening in Vienna is something that, uh, can certainly be done here, yeah, right? And so there's mm -hmm. a lot to learn from this example, and there are probably others, and I'm sure there are others that she talks about in her book. Yeah. So just another reason to sort of add this to our, our running list of, of books. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, all right. Well, I think that's all we've got this time. Yeah. And Aaron, my friend, you're up next. What are you I bringing am. to the table in our next episode? Uh, our next episode, I'm going to bring another article from the Forge's State of Abolition issue. Oh, if you sweet. remember a few weeks yes. ago, I brought two. Um, so I'm going to bring one this time okay. uh, because it made sense just to talk about this one, I okay. think. Uh, this one is written by Maria Thomas and it's called Beyond Do No Harm, Health, Justice, and Abolition. Maria Thomas is from Interrupting Criminalization and does quote, work to bring together healthcare workers and organizers to craft solutions to end the use of the healthcare system as an extension of the carceral state. Ooh. So this is all about the Beyond Do No Harm network uh, at Interrupting Criminalization and the work they're doing to do exactly that and bring healthcare workers and organizers together to change the way that healthcare is connected to the carceral state. Wow, that sounds powerful. I think you know, we haven't talked a whole lot about like health justice, right? Just sort of yeah. as an extension of um, social justice. And so uh, I'm excited about this. Uh, and it sounds like, you know, I, we also love everything that the Forge puts out there, right? And the state of abolition issue has been great so far. So yeah, that sounds exciting. I'm looking forward to checking that out. Very good. Yeah. 
Good stuff. All right. So with that, we want to thank you for joining us today and for listening to Interdependent Study. Uh, you know what we want you to do here, but in case you've forgotten, please follow, leave a rating and review, share our podcast with the people in your life. Follow us on all the socials, including the TikTok. Uh, check us out on YouTube and sign up for our email list to get notified about any new things we've got going on behind the scenes. Yes. Thank you for listening. And remember, it's not about us, but it is about us. And we'll talk to you next week. Bye.